Outer Strike by Eric Nyland is the third book in the original Halo novel trilogy, following Halo The Fall of Reach and Halo The Flood. It originally came out in 2003, and in 2010 it was republished with minor edits and bonus content. When it was released, Halo 2 was on the horizon, and it served as both an end to the trilogy and a bridge between Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. It is widely considered the best of the three books, and it is notable for making Sergeant Johnson a main character, giving the Master Chief some character development, and introducing one of the most controversial elements in the Halo series. We're going to attempt time travel. Yes, time travel, that big reset button of science fiction. It can be awesome if pulled off correctly, but it is really difficult to do so, and a lot of people found the book less than stellar because of it. Following this book, time travel has only been used for I Love Bees, a marketing campaign intended to be non-canon, and the non-canon crossover with Dead or Alive 4, which takes place in the same original alternate continuity of I Love Bees. Bungie's Frank O'Connor admitted that no one really cared for the Halo universe incorporating time travel, and a result of this is that the book's ending cliffhanger implying that the Covenant will end up using time travel offensively is never followed up on, possibly for the best. Indeed. Though it's not like Halo doesn't get really corny at times anyway. This makes First Strike stand out as an almost self-contained story, with a stable time loop as its main plot. What First Strike really does is take us back to the beginning, both literally with time travel and thematically, and gives the characters a second chance. Halo Combat Evolved used a format where the second half of the game took us through the same levels as the first half in reverse, with the prettiness replaced with ugliness, until we finally destroyed everything and were left with only the Master Chief and Cortana stoically going out alone. First Strike is like the ugly reverse of the Fall of Reach, enabling the characters to get back there with time travel and showing the ugly side of the Reach setting until its ultimate destruction. Now with the opportunity to save more people and ensure that Master Chief isn't quite so alone, right away it reverses the ending pronouncement that the Chief and Cortana are the only survivors of the Halo incident by having Cortana realize that her assessment was wrong and that there is a surviving pelican with UNSC soldiers in it, as well as a squadron of Covenant ships that includes a flagship, the Ascendant Justice. It becomes the Chief's goal to rescue the soldiers and lead them to commandeer the Ascendant Justice in order to resume his original mission in Fall of Reach, where the Spartans and Cortana were going to go into Covenant space, capture a prophet, and force the Covenant to negotiate a truce. This pelican is host to characters that thematically continue the cast of characters present in Halo Covenant Evolved and Halo of the Flood. Corporal Locklear, as subordinate of the Flood's Major Silva, sharing his distrust of Spartans. Warrant Officer Sheila Pulaski, a Pelican pilot compared to Foehammer, only Lieutenant Elias Haverson, closest thing to Captain Keyes, along with Whitcomb later on, and Sergeant Johnson. In a way, this is our first introduction to the character of Johnson. The Fall of Reach had a minor character named Johnson, who was just some minor soldier impressed to see that a Spartan was on board. There is no description of him and no indication that he was supposed to be the unnamed Black Sergeant in Halo Combat Evolved, which was based on the alien's character of Sergeant Apone, and being a flamboyant action movie character with some wacky lines, who ultimately gets killed by alien parasites. For the Flood, William Dietz decided to reference this character as Sergeant Johnson, thus bridging him with the minor Fall of Reach character, and then proceeded to kill him off as with the plot of Halo Combat Evolved. For First Strike, Eric Nyland chose to use his writer's Hand of God to rescue Johnson from the ravages of the Flood, with the explanation that he has cancer that makes him immune to flood infection, and make him into a real character. Mm -hmm. Damn right I am! Now, Sergeant Johnson will become my favorite character in the Halo series. However, in his early days, Johnson is surreal. He's a goofy action movie stereotype in a corny science fiction adventure. Far from the serious war-weary marine he'll be portrayed as in Halo Contact Harvest, this leads to him saying things that sound unduly mean or oddly ignorant when taking his character as a whole. Don't worry. I know what the aliens like. But I don't know the difference between unyielding hierophant and uneven elephant. I'm kind of stupid like that. This isn't Johnson in his best form, but it does provide the necessary foundation to prop up what becomes the main character of Johnson. 
They pull off this madcap stunt of slingshotting around bases, getting the Ascendant Justice to drop its shields to fire on the Pelican so that they can land the longsword in the shuttle bay. Cortana hacks the ship's network, gets control of the doors, as you would expect a Bungie AI to do, and locks the Covenant into their various rooms, allowing the UNSC soldiers to take control of the ship. With Cortana and Pulaski, there is a decent feminine presence in the unit. While Pulaski is compared to Fohammer, she isn't restricted to the Pelican like she is, and instead fights Covenant in the corridors with the others. I can't help but note that Pulaski is the only female soldier in a group of four, but it's alright overall with Cortana's addition. While in the network, Cortana encounters a Covenant AI, the first anyone has ever seen. Cortana assumes that the Covenant has been building their ships based on the UNSC example, which would include a shipboard AI. The AI in question is massively degraded and strongly believes in the Covenant religion. Cortana finds it strangely familiar. The most obvious implication is that it is some captured UNSC AI that has been gutted and reprogrammed haphazardly. Cortana isolates it for further study. The other Covenant ships fire on them, so Cortana takes the Ascendant Justice into the atmosphere of the gas giant Threshold. She evades the Covenant, but gets stuck in the gravity well. No one has ever pulled off a jump to slip space inside a planet's atmosphere, but the Chief orders her to try anything, so she does some quick scientific breakthroughs, as you do, and does the impossible. Now they just need to figure out a destination. The Chief wants to resume his mission of capturing a prophet and forcing a truce, but the others reason with him that the mission just doesn't make sense anymore. With Reach destroyed, it makes more sense to take the Ascendant Justice to Earth and let Oni reverse engineer its components so that they can incorporate superior alien technology into UNSC ships. The Chief agrees to hand it over to Oni, but he insists on following the Cole Protocol to prevent leading Covenant to human planets, which involves thoroughly searching the vessel for tracking devices. They can't afford to do that, so they plan to go back to Reach and look for an operational UNSC ship that they can take to Earth and then send Oni back to the Ascendant Justice. On the way there, the human characters meet the Engineers for the first time, flying pink, bulbous, tentacled aliens that exist to fix things. Engineers were first glimpsed in Halo of the Fall of Reach, but presumably Oni kept them under wraps and no one really knows anything about them. They were originally intended to be included in Halo Combat Evolved as enemy non-combatants, but they didn't make it into the final build, probably because Bungie couldn't figure out how to fit them into the gameplay mechanic. They would eventually be featured in Halo 3 ODST as suicide bombers, sympathetic because of their status as prisoners of the Covenant, but still combatants that the player can fight, similar to Grunts. The game would also include an engineer defector named Virgil, who promises to help Oni defeat the Covenant and ends up working with Johnson. They're prisoners or slaves, either way, they don't like the Covenant any more than we do. They are depicted as fascinating and maybe cute. The soldiers wouldn't say cute, but they react to the engineers like that. The engineers are fundamentally neutral in the conflict. Their very understanding of it is questionable, as they don't care that the humans now run the ship. All they care about is seeing that everything is operational. Cortana accesses information about their language, and she communicates with one through the chief's armor and gets it to repair the armor. Haverson admires the Engineer, wonders about its place in the Covenant caste system, and then, as soon as it finishes its job, kills it, out of fear that it could spread this knowledge to the Covenant. Everyone reacts like he just killed a puppy, but they accept his action as the right thing to do. Now, the self-awareness of the Engineers is unclear at this point, but I don't think that our heroes have any good reason to think that they're anything other than alien people with strange priorities. The Bestiarum, a booklet included with Halo 3, would clarify that the Forerunners created them as a slave race, so it makes sense that they're docile and don't really care about the politics of the species that control them. The Forerunners considered them nothing more than tools, and it makes sense that they could be interpreted as such with the specific framing of Forerunner or Covenant information that treats them as tools. But these characters are approaching it from an ignorant human perspective. The Bestiarum is written from a Forerunner perspective, and it confuses a lot of Halo fans into thinking that the Engineers are just tools, but I don't think Haverson knows enough to make that mistake. Everyone acts like shooting the Engineer is like shooting a puppy. Specifically a puppy with some kind of disease that needs to be kept from spreading to the rest of the dog population. Like maybe this is a puppy that ate Flood, and they don't want it to cause mutations that lead to dog Flood or something. 
Who feeds their dogs flood? That's stupid. The point is, killing it comes across as cruel because it's lovable, but there is this sense that it's ultimately expendable because it's not really a person. However, they have no good reason to think that it isn't a person. Haverson wonders about it fitting into the caste system. In an earlier scene, we even see from a grunt's perspective, Zawaz, who is pretty much just like Yaya from the Flood as a sympathetic prisoner of the Covenant Empire, whose elite superiors are literally called his masters. There is no good reason to think that the engineer isn't just like one of the sympathetic grunts. Haverson just killed an unarmed prisoner of war who gracefully surrendered. Haverson is a war criminal, and no one acknowledges this. He is accepted as a guy making the hard choices. He is not treated with malice like Colonel Ackerson, the jackass Oni operative who unlawfully tried to kill the Master Chief in Full of Reach. He is not even treated like Catherine Halsey, the morally gray creator of the Spartan program, who abducted civilian children to turn into super soldiers. He is completely absolved of his sins because he made the hard choice. He is essentially written like William Deeds wrote Captain Keys in the Flood in his little dalliance with war crimes in the treatment of Ilandowski. Keys tortured a scared subordinate for no good reason and gave her good reason to surrender to the Covenant, which she did, showing both dishonor and a lack of strategy on his part. But he's still treated as this military genius who honors his family. While absolutely in violation of the Geneva Convention, it's at least somewhat understandable when dealing with a soldier actively impeding progress by suggesting surrender, but the engineer is not at all hostile. It's surrendered without the slightest protest. Haverson has a duty to treat it with respect, and instead he displays very dishonorable conduct by shooting it in cold blood. And no one cares! Between Dowski and this, they're making the insurrectionists look sympathetic. It's little wonder that they're ultimately treated romantically in works like Halo Evolutions, and somewhat in the adjunct of the 2010 edition of this book. The rebellious chaos is more attractive than the UNSC's dishonorable fascism. This is the kind of thing that really makes me appreciate what Karen Travis brings to the series. Speaking of fascism, the book takes an interlude to visit the Hive, the UNSC headquarters in Sydney, Australia. Reach survivor Lieutenant Wagner arrives to give a report to Oni Brass. It's a very patriarchal group, with Wagner and the UNSC leaders all male, while a female receptionist waits outside. Wagner notes that the receptionist seems sneaky and considers recruiting her into Oni Section 3, the sneakiest branch. And it's an illustration of how weak the UNSC is after the loss of Reach that the Oni spies would consider bolstering their numbers with low ranking personnel. It really illustrates First Strike's sexism in contrast to Halo Glasslands, which would introduce Oni leader Margaret Parangalski and her protege Sarah Nozman in the same Hive setting. The Hive meeting in First Strike serves two purposes, introducing Oni leader Lord Hood, who would be a prominent protagonist in Halo 2, and bringing back Colonel Ackerson as an antagonist to Catherine Halsey, and noting that he is now leader of a competing project to Halsey's Spartan 2 program, which is a setup to the next novel, Halo Ghost of Onyx. Ackerson rages around and is generally presented as a jackass officer that readers can love to hate. And while he's not very nice, it's wrong to present him as uniquely evil, in contrast to Haverson and Keyes, who also do terrible things but are presented as honorable. There are no shades of grey to be found with these designated heroes. The Ascendant Justice goes to Reach, but it also travels three weeks into the past, to when the planet is still under siege. The reason why they time travel is attributed to a Forerunner artifact, a mysterious morphing crystal that warps space-time, but it's ultimately a tautology. The reason that they time travel is because the crystal enabled it, and the reason the crystal enabled it is because they time travel, so it needed to enable it to prevent a paradox. What? You could really blame the crystal for anything! Why did Reach fall? It has nothing to do with military strategy, the force of the Covenant fleet, or any of the intrigue. Clearly, the crystal made it happen. After all, if Reach never fell, it would never have to enable time travel. And it has to enable time travel, because it always enabled time travel! The whole Halo backstory could be blamed on the crystal! Well, for better or worse, they're three weeks in the past, and they have a chance to salvage some Reach resources they thought forever lost to them. Like Master Chief's fellow Spartans. Yes, the characterization of the last Spartan no longer applies. Red Team Alpha, 
The group of Spartans presumed to die defending the orbital defense platforms, consisting of Fred, Kelly, and Joshua, gets new orders from Vice Admiral Danforth Whitcomb to come to his position in Camp Independence. They do a series of badass stunts as they make their way through the ugly reflection of the Halo Fall of Reach setting, an aesthetic that is so entertaining that they turned it into the game Halo Reach. Joshua dies along the way in a suicide attack, and Fred and Kelly continue on their own. Even though Fred is a POV character, Kelly gets her share of badassery and gets to save Fred from some hunters. They get overwhelmed and fall back to an Oni facility called Castle Base, built into the mines of Manakite Mountain. There, they meet up with Red Team Delta, consisting of Spartans Isaac, Vin, and Will. They also reunite with Dr. Catherine Halsey, the civilian leader and maternal figure of the Spartan Project. At this point in the series, Halsey is a tragic figure, a brilliant woman who sacrificed a bunch of kids for the greater good of protecting the UNSC from rebels. She's a bit morally gray, but also likable. There is a strong sense of her caring for her Spartans as children. I don't think that Nyland viewed her as a scary mad scientist, but the later installments definitely depict her as such, including notably in Glasslands. In First Strike, she is more or less Team Mom. Mom. She continues her feud with Colonel Ackerson. Even though Ackerson escaped to Earth, he left Arakquil, his AI that looks like a devil, to keep her out of his files. You know how people look like their pets. She battles it with the help of Kalmia, an older generation version of Cortana. At this point, I have to imagine her as the Windows Phone PA. Where is Master Chief? That's classified. I really get the sense that Araquiel is Ackerson's pet, and that he represents Ackerson's malicious nature and a fantastic avatar. Halsey characterizes them both as sociopathic, and her as better than Ackerson because she cares about the value of human life. Cortana is built from Halsey's neural patterns, and Colmia is presumably similar, so she also acts as an extension of Halsey. You've got the Halsey-Ackerson battle, and you've got their pets. In this fight, they are distinguished as the apathetic, aggressive masculine versus the empathetic, maternal feminine. It is like the Flood's characterization of McKay as having magic empathy powers just because of being a woman, but less grounded in 18th century pseudoscience and instead modern gender roles. Halsey's fight with Araquiel is started and finished with a theme of cowboy rebelliousness. Her whole reason for engaging him is based on the belief that she knows better than her Oni superiors and can take advantage of the resources he controls, even though Oni saw fit to deny her access. It makes sense in context, given that desperate times call for desperate measures, and she is the only one who could make use of whatever was left behind, but it still represents her egotistical approach. Her method for defeating him involves a failsafe command, whatever it takes that she implanted an important smart AIs to give her control that her superiors lack. She is a rebellious force we are supposed to respect because she works for the betterment of the UNSC overall, if not for certain parts of Oni. This ties into her justification for the Spartan 2 program's abduction of civilian children, whatever it takes. Shortly after deleting Araquiel, she is reminded of the abduction process, and there is a distinct lack of empathy for the children she had abducted. She just thinks about how they're basically her children, even though they don't see it that way. Although John does, unbeknownst to her. And then she specifically feels guilty about the Flash clones that she had created to replace them, because they would have lived short, miserable lives. About the time you might get them to be coherent, to talk and walk, all these little errors in their systems add up and you get a metabolic cascade failure. She would have preferred to not have Flash clones, so their creation is a waste that she can feel sorry over, but the main thrust of the Spartan 2 program can be justified as whatever it takes. She is a rebel who defies common ethics because she thinks doing whatever it takes for the greater good is justified. This is a common theme in American storytelling, and it means that the reader can still respect her as a protagonist. We can respect the rebel who works for the greater good, the greater good of maintaining UNSC authority against rebels. Yeah. It's often forgotten that the Spartan program was not developed as a means of defending the human race against the Covenant. It was made to maintain the authority of the UNSC in a time of civil war. The UNSC being essentially the US government under martial law, it has the unfortunate consequence of endorsing fascism. Especially in this book where they keep making references to American history. Castle Base's decor is even based around holding up flags of put-down rebellions in celebration of the UNSC's military might. This imperialism will not be criticized at all until Halo the Coal Protocol in 2008. 
The ultimate irony of Halsey's rebelliousness is that it's not used to make the rebels sympathetic and instead bolsters the UNSC's fascism by casting a bad light on their internal checks and balances, trying to keep a goodly character like Halsey from being able to do whatever it takes. Halsey hacks into Eckerson's files and uncovers more setup for Ghosts of Onyx. Oh, what's he doing with files on the Spartan 2 program? And what on Reach could S3 stand for? And why does he have coordinates that lead to a part of space with no listed planet? Hmm. She learns that Castle Base is built into an underground Forerunner facility. That might have something to do with why the Covenant haven't melted this mountain into glass yet. It looks like a good fallback position, so she preps her Spartans with Halo 2 armor and weapons, and leads them into the tunnels while the Covenant use some form of scarab to dig their way after them. In a surreal scene, all the Spartans admire the M6E Magnum, like it's a huge upgrade from the M6D, even though Bunchy specifically switched it out because the M6D was overpowered in Halo Combat Evolved. I guess the author didn't get the memo. To be fair, I Love Bees makes the same mistake. Is that the tip of an M6 I see poking out from under your jacket, babysitter? Or are you just excited to meet Ben Kinkel? M6C. Chamber to 12-7. Yeah. 12 shots. Yeah. While in the tunnels, Fred gets that instinctual urge to mess with Forerunner glyphs and opens up a hallway, leading to a giant chamber, containing a central pedestal with a magic crystal, like that gold idol from Indiana Jones. It alters space-time so that they can't move in a straight line. Fortunately, Kelly has great aim with a firearm, so she can turn off her visor and walk blindly in a random direction and be able to lead them to the crystal. No, really. Yeah, having the ability to accurately shoot people gives you magic navigation powers. What, didn't you know? Well, she is a woman, so maybe she has it in place of magic empathy powers. They get the crystal, and it releases radiation that presumably sends the Ascendant Justice back in time, because it needs to, because it needs to. Upon arriving in Reach Orbit, they get a sense of the situation with the Covenant still there, still attacking, some humans still left alive, and Cortana monitors the Covenant broadcasts. She has some difficulty understanding the Covenant language, but she does pick up something about a Guardian of the Luminous Key that is supposed to be on the Ascendant Justice. It's unclear what this refers to. Some speculate that it's the name of the Covenant AI, in which case the Luminous Key could refer to the Forerunner Crystal, which probably had something to do with its creation. You might be mistaking the future for the past. Luminous Key could also refer to the Activation Index, which might be associated with the Covenant AI. Weird time travel stuff. I personally follow the theory that it is the title of one of the elites on board, a character implied to be Thelvotomy, the elite to become the Arbiter in Halo 2. This has never been confirmed, and the Halo graphic novel in 2006 indicates that Thelvotomy was instead the Supreme Commander on a ship called Seeker of Truth. I think that Bungie wanted to distance themselves from First Strike, they didn't like the time travel, and they also retconned how Johnson survived the Flood, so it's reasonable to imagine that they didn't like what Nyland did with Vodomy and wanted the Guardian of the Luminous Key to become some different elite, if not the Covenant AI. That makes reading this a weird experience. From a 2006 onward standpoint, the Guardian of the Luminous Key is probably just some random elite, mentioned as being on the Ascendant Justice and never mentioned again. But in the context of the book itself, the Guardian of the Luminous Key is probably best interpreted as the future Arbiter. Assuming Luminous Key refers to the Activation Index, it would refer to the Arbiter's role to acquire the Index and bring it to the Control Room, as he ultimately undertakes in Halo 2. Unfortunately, we cannot confirm anything. 